Welcome and hello. This is a video tutorial in HECRAS, and in this lesson, I'm going to be talking about global boundary conditions for 2D flow areas. All right, so what I have on the screen here is the HECRAS 2D user's manual for global boundary conditions. I'll go ahead and leave a link to this page in the description of the video in case you're uh, interested in reading all the details. All right, now what I got on the screen is my HEC RAS. Here's the file menu GUI at the top and HEC RAS mapper down below. What I have in RAS mapper here is a river system that's sketched out. Blue is the river center line with some cross sections and a 2D flow area that's here in magenta. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with those global boundary uh, conditions. So to do so, I'm gonna go up to the edit menu and click on unsteady flow data. And next, what we want to click on is this meteorological data. So now what we're talking about is global boundary conditions like precipitation, evapotranspiration, wind, and waves. In the previous lesson on internal and external boundary conditions, that was lesson number 82, we talked about precipitation, just a constant precipitation. But using this precipitation in the meteorological data tab, We'll have much more flexibility as far as varying that precipitation in both space and time. So across the top, these are going to be the three main parameters for global boundary conditions, precipitation, evapotranspiration, and then wind, and then waves. All right, so let's go ahead and get started uh, with precipitation and evapotranspiration. The first step would be to change this disable to enable. And then now down below, we have a number of parameters to input. This is precipitation. This is evapotranspiration. Oops, I have evapotranspiration set to point already. Okay, so this is how it should have started right here. Precipitation, let me go ahead and uh, check out our options. We have point, gridded, and constant. I'll go ahead and explain constant first because that's pretty straightforward. I'll click on constant and then I go ahead and type in my constant precipitation. Type in a value and then go ahead and type in your units. And that is the constant precipitation rate that will occur during the simulation. This ratio right here is a way to scale up the existing precipitation, regardless of the mode. It could be constant, point, or gridded. But uh, whatever you type in here, if I wanted to double the precipitation, I'd go ahead and put a two. If I wanted to make it the same, it'd be a one, or you could just leave it blank. That's what that's used for. And also I can override the units. So right now it's inches per hour, but I can change it to millimeters per hour just by using this uh, drop down box right here. All right, so the other uh, types of precipitation, the other modes is point and gridded. Let's go ahead and check out gridded. Now, if I say gridded, I'll have to next specify the source. And that can either be a DSS file or a raster file. If I click on DSS, for instance, then I need to specify a file name and a file path to that precipitation data. What it's looking for in this situation is a gridded data set that contains the precipitation data. So those of you who know HEC HMS probably know what I'm talking about here. A precipitation grid set is most often times the product of using the importer tool, a shape file, and then some other source data that contains the grib data or the .bil data depends on your particular data source. The other option is to upload a raster file. So I'd go ahead and click on raster file here. And then what I need to click on is this button, ra import raster data. And when I do that, I would navigate to my netcdf files or grib files or gdal files. If I go this route with raster files and netcdf files or grib files, this would also require a separate import process. Now there is an importer tool that's part of HEC Vortex, as well as that importer tool is integrated into HEC HMS, but not into HEC RAS, at least not to my understanding. And it's, I feel like I'm not doing this lesson justification by not actually going through that example. However, it's a little bit too detailed. So what I'm going to do is do another exercise or lesson video and explain the details about how to grab some gridded precipitation data and then use it in this global boundary condition. I haven't decided if it'll be DSS or uh, raster data, but I'm leaning towards DSS file. The next mode, the, af the last mode to talk about here is point. Here, <laughs> you're already seeing my, my data that I 
prepared for. So say, for instance, we have three points, A, B, and C. I'll go ahead and enter this data again. But what's happening here is, say, for instance, we have multiple locations in our watershed or in and around the location of, of interest. So say, for instance, we have point A, B, and C. We have precipitation time series data, those three points. Therefore, we know the exact precipitation at those points, but we could use this point method and a specific interpolation method to determine what is the time series in a grid for all the points in this particular view. So that's how the point method works. Let's go ahead and actually type in some numbers. So what I would do, for instance, is get the lat long location of all of my precipitation time series gauge data or the northing easting values. So right down here in the bottom left corner, I have uh, easting and northing values according to the particular projection that I have in my RAS mapper. So what I could do is just hover over the mouse and say, instead of A, B, C, maybe I'll just go one, two, and three. Maybe my precipitation gauge one is right here. My precipitation gauge two is over here. And then my precipitation gauge three is right over here. All right, so let me go back to the boundary conditions. What you're going to do is click on this create edit stations right here. This is going to be used not only for precipitation, but for a few of the other parameters as well. So create edit stations. Now we can go ahead and define our stations. So the first point, the point would be a station. I'll go ahead and say new station or a new point right here. So I'm going to call this station one, STA one, and then click OK. It's giving me a default height of 10 meters. That's fine. And then for the X and Y values, this is the, the easting and the northing parameters. I'm just going to type in some numbers. So that is that. I'll go ahead and click OK. Now that one station A has been saved right there. I can also input this data in the table view. So this right here was the, this is the detailed view, but this is the table view over here. In fact, let me go ahead and do this uh, just using the detailed view because I noticed that the longitude and latitude popped into place here, and that didn't work when I typed the values directly into this table view when preparing for the lesson. So let me go back here. I'm going to create a second point. I'm going to call this station 2, STA2. OK. I'll only type in the X and Y values. OK. So there they are. I'll click OK. Oops. I guess I don't have to close it every time. So station 1, station 2. Station one, Here, this here's station three coming in. All right, now X and Y values, three, eight, one, tab two, four, oh, nine, eight, four, eight. Okay, so that looks good. I'm gonna click on the table tab here and it looks like the lat long calculated for all three of those points. That looks good. Let's uh, click this button to plot point locations. Okay, so we have three points right here with a little outline, that looks good. I'll click close. And I'm going to say, OK, now that we have our three points, I'm not sure why these points are still here. I deleted the points and it looks like the garbage collection routine within ECRAS just hasn't caught up yet. But what we want to do is click on this edit button here. Remember, we're still in precipitation. So I'll click edit. Here are the three points to choose from. So we'll start with station one. Now the source can either be a DSS file, a table or a constant. So constant's pretty straightforward. This is just, we've seen this already, a constant precipitation of 0 0.1 inches per hour. I'll go ahead and define station two using the table data. So say for instance, the simulation starts at the beginning of the day, we'll say it's January 1st, 2020. Okay, so there's that. And then I would just type in the, well, it's period average. This is really uh, period cumulative as the data type. And then I just go ahead and type in some numbers here. All right, so I typed in some numbers here. This is period cumulative precipitation, uh, one hour at a time. That's the time interval that's being set here. And let's go down to the third option, station three. This is going to be an example for DSS data. I do have an example prepared here. This is just a time series data set. So yeah, I should probably mention this checkbox up here also needs to be checked for all of the stations that are actually going to be used in this interpolation process. All right, so let's go back to station three. They're all checked. I'm going to navigate to the DSS file by clicking on this folder icon. And this is my file right here, data.dss. Now I need to specify the path. So I actually have time series data set for all three points, but this is point C. So in part F, I'm going to select point C and then click OK. All right, so I'll click OK. 
Next, this is an optional button, rasterization parameters. This is going to allow us to set the extents and the cell size of the interpolation routine that's being generated using the points that we just set and their precipitation data. So what we have here is the top, upper left point. So this would be the furthest west, and then top would be the furthest north on the map. The number of rows, columns, and cell signs. Now, if you're not sure what to use, you can click this button here that will base these values on the current meteorologic station extents right there. And then I can go ahead and just plot the raster extents. Okay, so I'm only seeing one point here, and this extents is much too large. I need it to be uh, zoomed in on just this area. So let me close that. And I think these numbers are all right. I'm just going to go ahead and say 100 and then set a cell size of 100. So it's a nice round number and then click OK. OK, that's much better. So I see the three points right here and then this red dashed range uh, line here represents the range or the extent of the interpolation. And based on the scale for the easting here and then the northing here, that also looks really good. OK, so I'm going to click close here. The last thing we need to do is specify the interpolation method. So the first one here is the default. This is called the Thiessen polygon method. And using this method, this is sort of a traditional method where they use the linear bisector lines between gauge stations. And then whichever gauge station that the particular cell is closest to, that cell adopts that gauge station's pattern, not necessarily the total precipitation, but the pattern of the precipitation. And then that um, precipitation is actually calculated using the inverse squared distance method. All right, not unlike the next two options, which are also inverse distance squared methods. So this is true inverse distance squared method. And then the third is inverse distance squared method restricted which is the exact same as the inverse distance squared method, except if a particular cell is in a triangle that could be drawn out by three specific precipitation gauges, the calculation is simplified and it only uses the data from those three points when calculating a precipitation. The last option is peak preservation. This particular method attempts to retain the intensities within a storm because other methods suffer from diminishing intensity based on different gauges having peak intensities at different times. All right, so that is it for precipitation. We have uh, evaporation, evapotranspiration to deal with next. So if I scroll down here, our methods are point and constant. I'll go ahead and select constant because that's pretty straightforward. We'll specify the evapotranspiration in units of either millimeters per hour or inches per hour. And this is constant, so it's for the entire time and for the entire extent of the model. The other mode for evapotranspiration is point. Now, as before, we can modify the points, the meteorological stations up here. We already have stations one, two, and three, so maybe we'll just use those again as well, which is probably not uncommon. I'm sort of scrolling down here on the right. So I can go ahead and click this edit button on the right. Now, keep in mind, we don't have any data here because we're dealing with evapotranspiration this time, not precipitation. So just as before, we can specify DSS data, table data, or constant value for that evapotranspiration. And then also make sure to check this checkbox on if you're using that particular station. All right, so go ahead and click OK. I don't need to do all that because it's the exact same as the precipitation. We need to specify an interpolation method as before. This time the options are a little different. We have nearest neighbor or inverse distance squared or inverse distance squared restricted. So go ahead and make that selection. And then that is it for evapotranspiration. Next up is wind. So both wind right here and waves sort of work together. These particular parameters are probably most used when you have a storm event that's close to the coast and where you have high changes in wind, velocity, and direction, as well as pressure. So for wind, our choices are direction, speed, or velocity x, y. So let me select speed and direction, and now let me scroll down to the bottom. Here we need to specify the wind speed and the wind direction, but if I happen to switch the wind method to velocity x, y, then what I would do is specify the wind velocity in the x direction and the wind velocity in the y direction. So it's basically just a different way of thinking of that wind speed. 
Okay, so let me go back to the first one, which was speed and direction. For the mode, let me go ahead and scroll down again. It keeps scrolling me up. For the mode on wind speed, I have point, gridded, and constant. So just like precipitation, the wind itself could be gridded and also point. If you go with point, you'd have to specify the interpolation method, specify which particular points you want to use for your wind speed data. And then let's see, if you wanted to go with gridded, then you'd specify the DSS data or your raster files as before, which would also require the importer tool. As far as wind direction, this is going to be either constant or gridded. The direction would be in degrees from zero to 360, where uh, due north would be zero degrees, and then due east that would be 90 degrees. So sort of like the bearing of the angle is what it's looking for there. And then lastly, we have air density. I think, yeah, so there's no <laughs> nothing to change there. And then air pressure is also a parameter that would most likely be used in a situation where the air temperature is fluctuating a lot in a small specified area of the storm. So we can go with point or gridded. Those are your options there with air pressure. As far as waves go, this is the last parameter on the far right. Our only option is wave forcing in the XY direction. Let, let me scroll down here. So we have wave forcing in the X direction, wave forcing in the Y direction. And just as before, we have options for point, gridded, and constant. All right, well, that was it for this lesson. We talked about the global boundary conditions, which are found in the meteorological data tab of the Unsteady Flow Data Editor in TechRise.